A girl walks into college with a backpack full of books. She finds her seat and then makes her way across the hall to distribute notes along with the week's timetable to her peers. All her projects are submitted on time and her grades are soaring. A few months later, she graduates at the top of her class and almost immediately gets a job at an esteemed company. Adding a cherry on the cake, she has a supportive mother and brother, a home to live in, food to eat, and blankets to combat the cold. Her life sounds perfect, right? She seems to have everything in place. How can she possibly be struggling with a mental illness? I am this girl, and though I am thankful every day for the privileges I have, I am also the girl struggling with anxiety and depression. For a long time, I was ashamed about my diagnosis. How could I feel this way? With what audacity was I sinking? So I woke up every day incapacitated by my brain, unable to move and drag myself to the shower. I sped through the day, taking tasks off my list, pasting a smile across my face. All this while inside, a loud, glaring alarm went off every second about how none of this was real. Everything felt like a dream. I always thought fear was something outside, something you could see at a distance, something tangible. Till the day I woke up, trembling, crying, and unable to lift my body off the bed. I felt fear staggering and then tumbling inside me. Multiple thoughts gushing a minute, I felt like I was standing outside watching my body work on autopilot. I was exhausted and tired of waking up every single day feeling this way. How could I explain it to people? Broken bones are easier to talk about because you can see them in an x-ray. But how do you speak about the disabling pain caused by your brain when it isn't visible to anyone? Many of us don't even know what the brain looks like, apart from those diagrams we studied in school of cloud-shaped clusters. I decided to speak to my mother first. I didn't expect her to understand, but she did, in a way, because she knew I wasn't lying or making things up. But after circling multiple streets and visiting every possible doctor, I reached a point where I was unable to find words to explain. Would any combination of words ever be able to explain it to someone who hasn't felt that way before? But I wanted to try again. So once again, I picked up a paper, but this time I turned towards a paintbrush. I filled multiple blank pages with bursts of shapes and colors, and it felt incredible. I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that I didn't want to stop. From watercolor paintings to digitally sketching, it became my daily activity. I would sit down and create visuals, each one telling a different story. I began noticing patterns in them, from colors and sizes, to shapes and repetitive motifs. There were variations depending on the way I was feeling on that particular day. We are taught that if we want to say something, we speak it. But what about saying something by drawing it? It felt like walking into a whole new world of possibilities. There was something so liberating about giving myself the chance to express without the mandate of words. And with every page that I filled with color, I realized that art doesn't judge us the way humans do. With art, I felt like my brain was tangible and that my feelings were valid. In 2002, Richard Smith, the editor of the British Medical Journal said, we will all be sick, suffer loss, hurt, and die. Health is not to do with avoiding these givens, but with accepting them, even making sense of them. If health is about adaptation, 
understanding and acceptance, then the arts may be more potent than anything medicine has to offer. And so this daily drawing became a form of understanding that diagnosis, trying to accept it and learning to cope with it. I realized that I'd begun forgetting little things like remembering to breathe or patting myself on the back every now and then or taking a break. So I began drawing them as reminders to myself and I started posting them online. People responded with comments like, I can relate to this and I needed to hear this today. And that made me realize that if people were able to use the art I was creating to make a space to express how they felt, then that was something. And so I kept drawing and painting and sharing. And around this time, I began working on a series called the A to Z of Mental Health. When we start learning a language, we're usually taught the alphabet first, right? That's typically the foundation. So I decided to turn to a combination of the alphabet and art to create a series that would open up some more conversations about mental health. People often make so many assumptions about mental illnesses. They say things like, why don't you just get over it? Or it's just a phase. Would they say that to you if you had a broken bone? And so I realized that there was some kind of comfort in knowing that someone else has gone through what you have, no matter which part of the world they were in. And the hope with the A to Z of Mental Health series was to create this kind of a safe space for honest conversations about mental health while also busting myths and battling stigmas associated with it. What I didn't realize, however, is that it would lead to the blooming of a wonderful community filled with kindness. But it did, and that's where the Garden of Kindness was born. So the Garden of Kindness began as an extension on this series on mental health and self-care. The idea was to create a space larger than just a limited time period for all of us to grow kindness and share it with others as well as with ourselves. When I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression, I didn't realize that it would stay for so long. I didn't realize that there were days to come that were going to be so alone, where I would sink deeper and deeper into that feeling. I didn't realize that there were ways to share and be that would make daily living and breathing a little less painful and a whole lot more meaningful. But there is, and of this I'm confident now because of the Garden of Kindness. Because every day we returned, they did and so did I to share a meaningful moment over a few words and visuals. And that translated to so much for me, and soon I realized for them too. In fact, we are taking Garden of Kindness offline this weekend right here in Mumbai for the first time, and soon, hopefully, around the world. But wait, am I saying that art will cure mental illness? Is that why I'm standing here in front of you today? No. In fact, I'll be the first to acknowledge that maybe art doesn't cure anything. Am I cured of my anxiety and depression after years of using art every single day? Definitely not. But art, if nothing else, helps make the daily struggles of being and existing a little easier. Art helps create a space to breathe amidst the chaotic hustle of our brains. It helps connect people and stories regardless of if they are across oceans. It helps us speak and find a voice even if we can't find words. Art helps us realize that whatever we are going through is our reality and that nothing makes it less than anyone else's. But most of all, art reminds us that our pain is pain too. And that sometimes it's okay 
to not be okay.